Bible, would you all turn with me to the Gospel of Mark? We're going to be looking at chapter 10 this evening, the Gospel of Mark chapter 10, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 to 12. And so the past couple of chapters, we've seen that Jesus has been revealing himself to his disciples. He's been preaching sermons, and these sermons are meant to illustrate his identity. He's been performing miracles, and they are meant to be physical demonstrations or illustrations for the disciples to recognize that he is the Christ. That is, he is Messiah, And we've seen that though they come to realize he is the Messiah, they still have struggled and wrestled with what Messiah has come to do and what his kingdom is like. And what we find is they are expecting what many of the Jews would have expected in that day, which is the Messiah to become a military leader or a a political liberator. But Jesus reveals that Messiah has not come to overthrow Rome physically, but rather to come suffer, die, and then rise from the dead. And so we've seen that Jesus has been kind of showing how his kingdom is an upside-down kingdom and how it's going to subvert their expectations. And so we looked at servanthood and how true greatness comes from being a servant because that's what Christ does. He is truly great, and he is coming to die for the sins of the world on the cross. And then last week, if you remember, we saw the flip side of his kingdom where we looked at hell specifically, and we see that there is also um, those who may reject Christ, and if you were that individual, you will see what you are choosing in its place rather than the kingdom that he offers Well, now what we're going to find at the beginning of chapter 10 is that Jesus is on his way, getting closer and closer to the cross. And this encounter where he's going to have some of these religious leaders question him and try to catch him once again in his words, you're going to notice that um, we're going to be talking about a topic that may not seem necessarily connected to this journey to the cross because we're going to be talking about divorce, and marriage. And you might think, once again, well, this kind of seems odd. We've been talking about Messiah and serving and greatness and the kingdom and hell. And now all of a sudden we insert marriage and divorce. And I, hopefully what we'll see is that when we think about truly the biblical understanding of marriage and what divorce represents, really it does show us so much of what Christ is going to accomplish on the cross for us. Because we know that in Christ, we see the true blessings of what marriage is meant to point us to. And what we also see is that what causes divorce so often is a hardness of the heart, is a rebellious nature, is is sin and, and causing a severing in a relationship. And so too, we know that's what Christ has come to mend. It's because all of us have sinned and become unfaithful to our God. And so though this may seem like a weird insertion, I think we still see how it can apply to this journey he's taking us on. He's wanting us to see what God's creation was meant to be, and we see how we have in our sin corrupted God's good plan and his good design. And so, once again, we'll be in chapter 10, and we'll read this this evening. It says, Then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again, and as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh." Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So that's where we'll stop in the text this evening. 
So Jesus now has been moving out of the area of Capernaum, which that's you know, kind of the final time that we, we're going to see them primarily in that region as we're moving closer to his moment to be on Calvary. So we see him geographically moving in that area as well as on the timetable um, of going to the cross. And what we find is that he continues to do what he's been doing. He's, he's teaching, and in Matthew's parallel account in Matthew 19, it says he's also healing people. So he's once again preaching the message, and he's also authentic the message with miracle working. And so he continues to do this, and it says that while he's now in this Judean region, it says that there are some more Pharisees who come, and once again, they're wanting to, to question him. They're wanting to try to test him and catch him and see if there's any way they can get rid of this Jesus of Nazareth who's been causing so much ruckus in this region. And so the question that they come up with this time is on divorce specifically. And they ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And so that's really what we're going to spend our time on tonight is, is thinking about that question and seeing how that relates to the design of marriage and some of the implications for that. And before we just go right into the text, I do want to just start off with a little preface here is I know as we talk about divorce, and I think that that's also, by the way, why the religious leaders decided to use this topic, it can be a touchy subject. It can, because it really, it touches so many of our lives. So many of us are probably, you know, affected or have been impacted by a divorce. It could be that you personally have gone through a divorce. It could be that maybe your parents divorced. Maybe you right now are having marital relations issues going on, and maybe you are even considering divorce as an option on the table. And so I think that there's a reason for this being really practical to our own lives, and I think maybe that's why the religious leaders wanted to bring this up, is because, you know, you say the wrong thing on marriage or divorce, and it can really start to divide and, and cause a lot of um, opposition and people to become very upset or frustrated emotionally. And so we're going to look at what Jesus says about this topic tonight, but just at, out of the gate, I just really want to be clear that as we go through this topic and as I start to, you know, unpack some of the, the principles of Scripture is I am not teaching this to condemn anyone. This message is not meant to condemn. Rather, this is meant to give us what God's Word says, to help us guide us along this journey, and then maybe to convict us so that we might be closer to Christ by the end of this message as we hope to apply it to our own lives. And maybe as you, even if it's not in your immediate context right now, maybe as you have a friend or someone who may be struggling with this later in, the lo- in, your, in their life, that you can actually give them wisdom and that you can counsel them on this and, and have a more biblical-minded view of marriage remarriage marriage, and divorce. So that being said, we see in verses 1 to 2, once again, they come with this question asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And I think what we're going to find in Jesus's response here is that divorce is never the ideal. Divorce is never the ideal. Once again, it says here that they start this question, though, and it says literally, we know their motivation. There's no question why they were asking it. It's not because they really wanted to know so that they could apply it to their own lives and help their community about marriage and divorce. Rather, it says they wanted to test them. So I already mentioned it could be because divorce can affect us and, and can you know, invoke some emotions in us. But there's more context to the story, actually. In fact, the area that Jesus is now in is Herod's territory. Now, if you remember earlier in the Gospel of Mark, there was something that happened with John the Baptist, where Herod divorces a spouse and then takes his brother's wife. John the Baptist calls him out on his sin, and we know John the Baptist is actually killed for speaking out on this adulterous marriage. So we see marriage, divorce, remarriage in the same region, and so it's very possible that the Pharisees know what happened to John the Baptist, and maybe they're thinking, he's going to speak out against Herod here, and we're going to get him killed right here and now. So that's one possibility. Another thing that's important in, in the context of this moment is that there was an ongoing Jewish debate in their culture between the two houses of Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai. Now, these are basically like your liberal um, Jew and your conservative Jew. And I'm not talking about political parties, but in, in how they understand it and interpret Torah, the law. And so what you'll find is that in the Hillel camp, they were pretty liberal. And they basically said that if a man wanted to divorce his wife, he could pretty much do it for any reason. 
and they're actually going to be pulling, and you're going to see what Jesus says here, but they're going to be pulling from a scripture, and what they use is they use one specific word, and they interpret that as basically anything that the, the man is displeased with his wife gives him justification for divorce. And so there were literally examples of if she burnt your dinner. If she burnt your dinner, you have a right to divorce her. Or another would be if you find a woman who you find to be prettier and she wants to marry you, then you can also, that would be you lose, you lose favor for her and you see somebody else. So that would be kind of the, the very extreme liberal side of this interpretation. And then on Shammai's side, he would say something along the lines of, well, you can't just divorce your wife for any reason. It would need to be some pretty serious reason. And so what it probably would have resulted in is something along the lines of maybe you find some type of indecency in her, some type of immorality that you were unaware of. Maybe she um, wasn't um, a virgin before marriage. Uh, maybe she had um, exposed herself in some capacity. Um, something of that nature. So it would have been something more serious. It would have just been for, for pretty much any reason. And so that was kind of the, the two camps of the day. And so it could be in this context that they're wanting him now to jump in and see, are you going to forsake Herod and say Herod is wrong and get yourself in trouble there? Are you going to pick a side here? Or are you maybe even going to just renounce what Moses said? Because Moses seems to give some type of permission for a certificate of divorce to be, to be given. So that's where Jesus then answers in verses three to four. And hopefully what you'll notice here is that what Jesus does is rather than saying, I'm with Shammai, I'm with Hillel, or he, he takes the bait and goes after Herod, what does Jesus do? He points to Scripture. That's what he does. And that's once again how we should seek guidance and wisdom when it comes to this topic of marriage, remarriage, divorce. Not how we feel, not what our culture is saying, but what does Scripture teach us? And this can be so hard when it comes to relationships, when emotions and, and finances and children can all be involved in this. But once again, this is a humble reminder that even in a heated debate, we must go to Scripture and see what it teaches. And so what Jesus does there is he, he asks them, well, what did Moses command you? What did Moses say about this in the Torah? And then they respond and say, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. So they're saying there was uh, a case where Moses allowed a certificate of divorce to be given and issued to the woman. And what they're quoting from is Deuteronomy 24, and I'm going to read this for us, verses 1 to 4. So this is where, what they're talking about. Jesus is asking them, what did Moses say? And they're saying, this is what he said in Deuteronomy 24. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. That's the word there that they key in on. So you'll, the two houses are debating on that word. What is the uncleanness in her that they're finding? Uh, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hand, and sends her out of his house. When she has departed from his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, if the latter husband detests her and writes her certificate, of divorce, puts it in her hand and sends her out of his own house. Or if that latter husband dies who took her as his wife, then her former husband who divorced her must not take her back to be his wife after she had been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So that's kind of the, the scripture that they're referring to and looking at. And so this is a moment in time where Moses is saying, I'm going to give you a um, permission to give a certificate of divorce to a woman in the case of you finding some type of uncleanness in her. But within this, if she is to marry another man and then that other man divorces her or something, the first husband can't just take her back like property. And, and she, doesn't, she has legal grounds and standing and that's what the, the certificate was actually meant to do is actually give her a little bit of, of freedom and some type of status because normally if you would be divorced or um, you know, if the husband is wanting to get rid of you, it would be because of an infidelity or adultery and which could lead to even stoning. And so it would have been a great, a great moral you know, sin or blot to be divorced from your husband and so the certificate was meant to hopefully give her some type of agency in the, in, the, in the matter and so that men couldn't just do whatever they wanted with women and get rid of them and take them back and, and, and so on. And so we see that Jesus, he points to this scripture and then they answer and say that Moses says, see, well, he gave 
them permission to write a certificate of divorce. But then Jesus goes on in verse 5 and explains why Moses did this. And he says here, um, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. So what he's explaining here is that though Moses gave them the ability to make a certificate of divorce in, in certain cases, what Jesus goes on to explain here is that this is still not a good thing. In fact, he's saying that the whole reason that divorce is necessary is because of the hardness of your hearts. Divorce is always caused because of sin. Now, that doesn't mean that every person in the, the, marriage, un, or the marriage unit is guilty of sin, but sin is ultimately what causes divorce in some way or another. And so he's saying that in God's wisdom here, he made a concession for a time to mitigate evil. That's what God was doing here. This is not God endorsing divorce and saying divorce is a good thing. Um, no one cares if you get a divorce. God's not affected by it. No, rather it's, no, God is not for divorce. It was actually something that was harmful. It was because of your sinfulness that God is allowing divorce. And even that was meant to mitigate the evil. Him giving a certificate was meant to protect the woman because there were going to be men that were going to take advantage of women regardless. And so hopefully this was going to be something where the man, if he was going to do this, she would have gotten her dowry back. And so the woman would have gotten some financial help, got some status, and if he were to do it, he couldn't take her back. And so though it still was not a good thing, we still see that God was utilizing our hardness of hearts, our wickedness, and he was mitigating it to keep from a greater evil to occur. I think this is a helpful principle as we think about some hard things that were happening in the ancient world, especially in the Old Testament. Think of like slavery. This is another important topic because some will be like, well, why does it seem like God doesn't just say immediately, you can have no slaves? You know, why didn't he just immediately abolish it? Or why wasn't that like the, the 11th commandment or something like that? Well, once again, it was so ingrained into their world, even if you think about it, into our own history not that long ago, even in our own nation, there was slavery. So think how prominent this sin was. And God has never thought it was not sin. It's always been sinful to own another human being made in the image of God. But what we see is this principle occurring once again where God is mitigating a greater evil by permitting things for a period of time and giving them principles that that would guide them to ultimately growing in sanctification. That they, and that's what we actually see happening. As people continue to meditate on the gospel, what Christ is accomplishing, we see how it was completely in contrast to slavery. You can't have the gospel preaching that there is the good news of freedom and salvation for all those made in the image of God and then say, but you're going to be my slave and you're lesser than me. See, we know that we are all made equal in Christ, right? There's no Jew, no Gentile, no male, no female. We're all one in Christ, and so it was incompatible with the gospel. So I think this is what Jesus is saying here, is that God will sometimes allow or permit something to mitigate a greater evil, but that does not mean that he endorses certain things. So that's, what, that's how we have to be careful and start to you know, compare and, and see how we harmonize the scriptures. And so he then goes on from there to say, okay, so he did it as a concession to the hardness of your hearts, but then he says, now let's look more what Moses has to say, and he points now to Genesis, also written by Moses, and he says, let's look at the very beginning. What does Moses say at creation? What happens here? And he quotes Genesis 1.27, and he quotes Genesis 2.24, and he's explaining that God has made them male and female, and it says that this reason a man is to leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. And so then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. So that's what he's kind of saying. He's showing us this is what marriage was supposed to be. From the very beginning, we look at creation. When God made man in his own image, he made the male and female he says this was the purpose for the home. This was the, the purpose for marriage. In fact, this is the very first institution that God creates. Before God creates the church or the government, he creates family, and this is what this purpose is for. And just in Jesus' answer, as he's quoting these scriptures from Genesis, there's multiple things we notice that what marriage is meant to be defined as. We see marriage is meant to be a monogamous, heterosexual, permanent one flesh relationship. That is what he shows us here in this short answer that he gives. That's a lot that he's giving us in just these couple of verses. 
It's a monogamous, heterosexual, permanent, one flesh relationship. That is, it is one man and one woman. So that is one and one that become a, a new unit. And it can't be a male and a male or a female and a female. God created them in the very beginning for a purpose. And sometimes people are like, well, Jesus never talked about homosexuality. And, and that's true. that He doesn't use the term because that term didn't even exist back then. And so some people are scandalized when they're like, did you know that the word homosexual or homosexuality wasn't even used in the Bible until much later uh, in, in our history? And it's like, well, that's because that word didn't exist. But they can describe the activity. And, and Jesus is making comments on what marriage is, what family is, why God made a male and a female what gender or sexuality is. So clearly they had an understanding and it wasn't like there weren't people that were males sleeping with males or females sleeping with females because we actually know in the, the Roman government, many of the emperors were having these type of relationships. So it's not like it was so foreign to them that they had just no concept on the matter. And what we find is that Jesus here, though some people just want to kind of ignore it, he is making the case, though he's not talking specifically about homosexuality, he is saying as he's defining marriage, what contains and what is understood to be a marriage. It's, a, it's one man with one uh, woman or one male with one female that come together and make one unit. But think about all the other scriptures. You know, obviously in the Old Testament, there are these Levitical laws that talk about it um, being a sin. But then we also see in the New Testament many passages that also list this practice as being a, a sin. So we, we can't view gay marriage to be just another type of marriage. Really, that is um, a contradiction in terms to say a gay marriage because that's not what marriage is. Right? That's like saying a, an evil God. Well, if God is perfect and holy, then he can't be an evil God, right? Or a married bachelor. It's literally a contradiction in terms. But just look at Romans 1, verses 26 to 27. It says, For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also, the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. Now, this is just one text of many in the New Testament that are addressing that there are people that were giving in to their passions and that males were going with males and were forsaking women and, and vice versa here. And so we see that this is clearly something that God is not in favor of and it's not consistent with Jesus's definition of marriage. But more than just the, the topic about monogamy, which by the way is becoming more and more prominent in our culture of discussion about polygamy and things like that, um, or polyamory, things like that. So it, we see monogamy, we see heterosexual um, being the definition of marriage, and then we see it being a permanent one flesh union in which they are meant to come together and they create something actually new. It's, it's not the same thing before they are married. God is actually joining them together in some spiritual, physical, and supernatural way here is what we're seeing in marriage. And there's this warning even to say that no man is to separate this unit. So we see this clear um, emphasis of what marriage is meant to be. And so he's wanting us to get it really clear here before he moves forward in explaining why then divorce is not supposed to be the way. But just before we go any further, though, I, I do want to just emphasize how marriage itself is the most intimate relationship that humans can have with one another. This is where God, in the very beginning, intended for men and women to get together and become a one flesh union, where you share everything with one another, in which you actually can produce new life, which, by the way, is the first command given to humans, is to be fruitful and to multiply. And in fact, we see that this unit, what God has created the, in, the, in the garden itself, is actually meant to be a picture of Christ and his church. So actually, it is revealing something to us about the gospel message, which is really interesting to think about. But in Ephesians 5, verses 31 to 33, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, so sound familiar, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so what we're seeing here is that marriage is literally meant to be a picture of Christ's sacrificial love, what he's about to do for them on the cross, and then the church's response is to respect, to honor, and obey him as the one who made that sacrifice 
Christ. And so when we see a good, healthy marriage, we actually see a, a good, healthy picture of what Christ does for us on the cross and how the church is supposed to live out their lives in holiness. So really cool to see how this really has a, a clear connection to what, what Jesus is doing in this gospel, is, is su- suffering and, and serving us. And so we see then that when we think about marriage, we see how it's a, 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 uh, the intent of creation. We see that it's a beautiful picture of intimacy. We, we see how it's meant to be permanent, that no man is meant to separate what God has done together or joined together. It's a, a work of God here. Um, we then come to the point where we see this, this warning now. So we see, okay, Moses made a concession because God was mitigating evil. We see that this is the true meaning of marriage and the purpose of it. But then in verses 10 to 12, what we find here is that it says that the disciples, after hearing this, they're kind of troubled. In fact, you'll even see in Matthew's uh, uh, parallel account in chapter 19 that it will talk about um, that they see this and they basically say, it seems like it's better not to get married. They're like, if this is literally you know, what you're going to warn us about, and you're saying that it's meant to be like, this is what marriage is. They, they're really concerned, and so they're asking him about it, it says in the text, and then Jesus goes on and says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her, and if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. So now what we find here is that God has created marriage and in, in, has intended it to be a permanent union that will never cease until obviously death. He then goes on and says, but if someone were to divorce their spouse in an unbiblical way, we actually see that it will lead to adultery. So an unbiblical divorce actually will promote adultery. That is sexual immorality, a grave sin, a grave sin that God has obviously condemned. And so I think it's important that we really hear this, that if we then take counsel from someone that says it's not a big deal, or we embrace the culture that says no-fault divorce is a valid option on the table, we really need to hear the words of Christ here that says if you're getting divorced, or if you're counseling somebody else to get a divorce, and they are not biblical grounds, then you're basically just opening the door for adultery on both sides here. Both sides can be, um, come a victim to the potential of adultery if you have an unbiblical divorce. And what this is meant to point to then is that though a divorce may be legal, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have gone away from God's obligations. Because when you make a vow to your spouse, not only are you making it to your spouse, but you're making it before God, and God is doing a work in your life. And so if you then are going to walk away from this vow that you are making, this commitment that you're making, we're going to see that there are actually some serious implications, once again, of, of adultery. Now, I see that we're basically at time, and I have so much more to get to in this text. We just basically got to the point of how he has framed the discussion, explained how divorce was never God's intent. It was never the ideal, and we see kind of his start to explain definition of marriage, and then the warning of what happens if you divorce unbiblically, But next time, which will be after our trip to Mexico, we'll start to unpack a little bit more. We'll do a quick refresher and review this, but we're going to look next at now, okay, are there any biblical exceptions to divorce? Are there any reasons why we could um, biblically um, be permitted in any circumstance to divorce where it would not be sin, where we would not be liable to committing adultery? And then also what I want to really unpack for us, which will be the final thing, which is how we will see in this is that divorce is still not the unforgivable sin. And I do want to leave that at least with us tonight as well because um, You might be hearing some of this and and maybe wrestling with some of this, but I do want to remind you that divorce is not the unforgivable sin. I just want you to think about the story of the woman at the well. She was a woman who had been married five times. And the person that she was with and most likely was sleeping with, maybe living with, was not her husband. This is a woman who has been divorced multiple times, been remarried unbiblically, and was probably committing adultery right in, in the relationship she was in. But Jesus still went to her, and Jesus offered her living water. And so I do want us to hear that, um, regardless of some of the the things that we haven't got to get to. I do want you to at least take that with you and remind yourself that Christ loves us even when we are unfaithful. I'll I'll close with this verse, 2 Timothy Timothy 2, verse 13. 
It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He loves you despite our unfaithfulness. He seeks after us. He offers us what he did for us on the cross. And his goal and his his hope for you is that you would be restored, that you would experience forgiveness and reconciliation, and not only for your relationship with him, but also any relationships that you have that need reconciliation. It could be a broken marriage, and God's desire is for that marriage to be healed, your relationships to be healed, that, that forgiveness would be a way of our lives, because when we understand that Christ forgives us for everything we've done, we surely should reflect that type of forgiveness to others who have wronged us, even great infidelity, because we have all committed spiritual adultery against our God. So hopefully we hear that and we are reminded that it's not the unforgivable sin. Don't feel condemned. Rather, see the beauty, the the picture of marriage, and then let us seek to to live out that reality in, in different facets of our lives.